the tragedy at brookbend cottage max said mr carlyle when parkinson had closed the door behind him this is lieutenant holyer whom you consented to see to hear corrected carrados smiling straight into the healthy and rather embarrassed face of the stranger before him mr hollyer knows of my disability mr carlyle told me said the young man but as a matter of fact i had heard of you before mr carrados from one of our men it was in connection with the foundering of the ivan saratov carrados wagged his head in good-humoured resignation and the owners were sworn to inviolable secrecy he exclaimed well it is inevitable i suppose not another scuttling case mr hollyer no mine is quite a private matter replied the lieutenant my sister mrs creake but mr carlyle would tell you better than i can he knows all about it no no carlyle is a professional let me have it in the rough mr hollyer my ears are my eyes you know very well sir i can tell you what there is to tell right enough but i feel that when all's said and done it must sound very little to another although it seems important enough to me we have occasionally found trifles of significance ourselves said carrados encouragingly don't let that deter you this was the essence of lieutenant hollyer's narrative i have a sister millicent who is married to a man called creake she is about twenty-eight now and he is at least fifteen years older neither my mother who has since died nor i cared very much about creake we had nothing particular against him except perhaps the moderate disparity of age but none of us appeared to have anything in common he was a dark taciturn man and his moody silence froze up conversation as a result of course we didn't see much of each other this you must understand was four or five years ago max interposed mr carlyle officiously carrados maintained an uncompromising silence mr carlyle blew his nose and contrived to impart a hurt significance into the operation then lieutenant hollyer continued millicent married creake after a very short engagement it was a frightfully subdued wedding more like a funeral to me the man professed to have no relations and apparently he had scarcely any friends or business acquaintances he was an agent for something or other and had an office off holborn i suppose he made a living out of it then although we knew practically nothing of his private affairs but i gather that it has been going down since and i suspect that for the past few years they have been getting along almost entirely on millicent's little income you would like the particulars of that please assented carrados when our father died about seven years ago he left three thousand pounds it was invested in canadian stock and brought in a little over a hundred a year by his will my mother was to have the income of that for life and on her death it was to pass to millicent subject to the payment of a lump sum of five hundred pounds to me but my father privately suggested to me that if i should have no particular use for the money at the time he would propose my letting millicent have the income of it until i did want it as she would not be particularly well off you see mr carrados a great deal more had been spent on my education and advancement than on her i had my pay and of course i could look out for myself better than a girl could quite so agreed carrados therefore i did nothing about that continued the lieutenant three years ago i was over again but i did not see much of them they were living in lodgings that was the only time since the marriage that i have seen them until last week in the meanwhile our mother had died and millicent had been receiving her income she wrote me several letters at the time otherwise we did not correspond much but about a year ago she sent me their new address brookbend cottage mulling common a house that they had taken when i got two months leave i invited myself there as a matter of course fully expecting to stay most of my time with them but i made an excuse to get away after a week the place was dismal and unendurable the whole life and atmosphere undescribably depressing he looked round with an instinct of caution leaned forward earnestly and dropped his voice mr carrados it is my absolute conviction that creake is only waiting for a favourable opportunity to murder millicent go on said carrados quietly a week of the depressing surroundings of brookbend cottage would not alone convince you of that mr hollyer i am not so sure declared hollyer doubtfully 
there was a feeling of suspicion and before me polite hatred that would have gone a good way towards it all the same there was something more definite millicent told me this the day after i went there there is no doubt that a few months ago creake deliberately planned to poison her with some weed killer she told me the circumstances in a rather distressed moment but afterwards she refused to speak of it again even weakly denied it and as a matter of fact it was with the greatest difficulty that i could get her at any time to talk about her husband or his affairs the gist of it was that she had the strongest suspicion that creake doctored a bottle of stout which he expected she would drink for her supper when she was alone the weed killer properly labelled but also in a beer bottle was kept with other miscellaneous liquids in the same cupboard as the beer but on a high shelf when he found that it had miscarried he poured away the mixture washed out the bottle and put in the dregs from another there is no doubt in my mind that if he had come back and found millicent dead or dying he would have contrived it to appear that she had made a mistake in the dark and drunk some of the poison before she found out yes assented carrados the open way the safe way you must understand that they live in a very small style mr carrados and millicent is almost entirely in the man's power the only servant they have is a woman who comes in for a few hours every day the house is lonely and secluded creake is sometimes away for days and nights at a time and millicent either through pride or indifference seems to have dropped off all her old friends and to have made no others he might poison her bury the body in the garden and be a thousand miles away before anyone began to inquire about her what am i to do mr carrados he is less likely to try to poison than some other means now pondered carrados that having failed his wife will always be on her guard he may know or at least suspect that others know no the common-sense precaution would be for your sister to leave the man mr hollyer she will not no admitted hollyer she will not i at once urged that the young man struggled with some hesitation for a moment and then blurted out the fact is mr carrados i don't understand millicent she is not the girl she was she hates creake and treats him with a silent contempt that eats into their lives like acid and yet she is so jealous of him that she will let nothing short of death part them it is a horrible life they lead i stood it for a week and i must say much as i dislike my brother-in-law that he has something to put up with if only he got into a passion like a man and killed her it wouldn't be altogether incomprehensible that does not concern us said carrados in a game of this kind one has to take sides and we have taken ours it remains for us to see that our side wins you mentioned jealousy mr hollyer have you any idea whether mrs creake has real ground for it i should have told you that replied lieutenant hollyer i happened to strike up with a newspaper man whose office is in the same block as creake's when i mentioned the name he grinned creake he said oh he's the man with the romantic typist isn't he well he's my brother-in-law i replied what about the typist then the chap shut up like a knife no no he said i didn't know he was married i don't want to get mixed up in anything of that sort i only said that he had a typist well what of that so have we so has everyone there was nothing more to be got out of him but the remark and the grin meant well about as usual mr carrados carrados turned to his friend i suppose you know all about the typist by now lewis we have had her under efficient observation max replied mr carlyle with severe dignity is she unmarried yes so far as ordinary repute goes she is that is all that is essential for the moment mr hollyer opens up three excellent reasons why this man might wish to dispose of his wife if we accept the suggestion of poisoning though we have only a jealous woman's suspicion for it we add to the wish the determination well we will go forward on that have you got a photograph of mr creake the lieutenant took out his pocket-book mr carlyle asked me for one here is the best i could get carrados rang the bell this parkinson he said when the man appeared is a photograph of a uh, mr what first name by the way austin put in hollyer who was following everything with a boyish mixture of excitement and subdued importance of a mr austin creek i may require you to recognize him parkinson glanced at the print and returned it to his master's hand may i inquire if it is a recent photograph of the gentleman sir he asked about six years ago said the lieutenant 
taking in this new actor in the drama with frank curiosity but he is very little changed thank you sir i will endeavour to remember mr creake sir lieutenant hollyer stood up as parkinson left the room the interview seemed to be at an end oh there's one other matter he remarked i am afraid that i did rather an unfortunate thing while i was at brookbend it seemed to me that as all millicent's money would probably pass into creake's hands sooner or later i might as well have my five hundred pounds if only to help her with afterwards so i broached the subject and said that i should like to have it now as i had an opportunity for investing and you think it may possibly influence creake to act sooner than he otherwise might have done he may have got possession of the principal even and find it awkward to replace it so much the better if your sister is going to be murdered it may as well be done next week as next year so far as i am concerned excuse my brutality mr hollyer but this is simply a case to me and i regard it strategically now mr carlyle's organization can look after mrs creake for a few weeks but it cannot look after her forever by increasing the immediate risk we diminish the permanent risk i see agreed hollyer i'm awfully uneasy but i'm entirely in your hands then we will give mr creake every inducement and every opportunity to get to work where are you staying now just now with some friends at st albans that is too far the inscrutable eyes retained their tranquil depth but a new quality of quickening interest in the voice made mr carlyle forget the weight and burden of his ruffled dignity give me a few minutes please the cigarettes are behind you mr hollyer the blind man walked to the window and seemed to look out over the cypress shaded lawn the lieutenant lit a cigarette and mr carlyle picked up punch then carrados turned round again you are prepared to put your own arrangements aside he demanded of his visitor certainly very well i want you to go down now straight from here to brookbend cottage tell your sister that your leave is unexpectedly cut short and that you sail to-morrow the martian no no the martian doesn't sail look up the movements on your way there and pick out a boat that does say you are transferred add that you expect to be away only two or three months and that you really want the five hundred pounds by the time of your return don't stay in the house long please i understand sir st albans is too far make your excuse and get away from there to-day put up somewhere in town where you will be in reach of the telephone let mr carlyle and myself know where you are keep out of creek's way i don't want actually to tie you down to the house but we may require your services we will let you know at the first sign of anything doing and if there is nothing to be done we must release you i don't mind that is there nothing more that i can do now nothing in going to mr carlyle you have done the best thing possible you have put your sister into the care of the shrewdest man in london whereat the object of this quite unexpected eulogy found himself becoming covered with modest confusion well max remarked carlyle tentatively when they were alone well lewis of course it wasn't worth while rubbing it in before young hollyer but as a matter of fact every single man carries the life of any other man only one mind you in his hands do what you will provided he doesn't bungle acquiesced carrados quite so and also that he is absolutely reckless of the consequences of course two rather large provisos creake is obviously susceptible to both have you seen him no as i told you i put a man on to report his habits in town then two days ago as the case seemed to promise some interest for he certainly is deeply involved with the typist max and the thing might take a sensational turn any time i went down to mulling common myself although the house is lonely it is on the electric tram route you know the sort of market garden rurality that about a dozen miles out of london offers alternate bricks and cabbages it was easy enough to get to know about creek locally he mixes with no one there goes into town at irregular times but generally every day and is reputed to be devilish hard to get money out of finally i made the acquaintance of an old fellow who used to do a day's gardening at brookbend occasionally he has a cottage and a garden of his own with a greenhouse and the business cost me the price of a pound of tomatoes was it a profitable investment as tomatoes yes as information no 
the old fellow had the fatal disadvantage from our point of view of labouring under a grievance a few weeks ago creake told him that he would not require him again as he was going to do his own gardening in the future that is something lewis if only creake was going to poison his wife with hyoscyamine and bury her instead of blowing her up with a dynamite cartridge and claiming that it came in among the coal true true still however the chatty old soul had a simple explanation for everything that creake did creake was mad he had even seen him flying a kite in his garden where it was bound to get wrecked among the trees a lot of ten would have known better he declared and certainly the kite did get wrecked for i saw it hanging over the road myself but that a sane man should spend his time playing with a toy was beyond him a good many men have been flying kites of various kinds lately said carrados is he interested in aviation i dare say he appears to have some knowledge of scientific subjects now what do you want me to do max will you do it implicitly subject to the usual reservations keep your man on creek in town and let me have his reports after you have seen them lunch with me here to-morrow phone up to your office that you are detained on unpleasant business and then give the deserving parkinson an afternoon off by looking after me while we take a motor run round mulling common if we have time we might go on to brighton feed at the ship and come back in the cool amiable and thrice lucky mortal sighed mr carlyle his glance wandering round the room but as it happened brighton did not figure in that day's itinerary it had been carrados's intention merely to pass brookbend cottage on this occasion relying on his highly developed faculties aided by mr carlyle's description to inform him of the surroundings a hundred yards before they reached the house he had given an order to his chauffeur to drop into the lowest speed and they were leisurely drawing past when a discovery by mr carlyle modified their plans by jupiter that man suddenly exclaimed there's a board up max the place is to be let carrados picked up the tube again a couple of sentences passed and the car stopped by the roadside a score of paces past the limit of the garden mr carlyle took out his notebook and wrote down the address of a firm of house agents you might raise the bonnet and have a look at the engines harris said carrados we want to be occupied here for a few minutes this is sudden hollyer knew nothing of their leaving remarked mr carlyle probably not for three months yet all the same lewis we will go on to the agents and get a card to view whether we use it to-day or not a thick hedge in its summer dress effectively screening the house beyond from public view lay between the garden and the road above the hedge showed an occasional shrub at the corner nearest to the car a chestnut flourished the wooden gate once white which they had passed was grimed and rickety the road itself was still the unpretentious country lane that the advent of the electric car had found it when carrados had taken in these details there seemed little else to notice he was on the point of giving harris the order to go on when his ear caught a trivial sound someone is coming out of the house lewis he warned his friend it may be hollyer but he ought to have gone by this time i don't hear anyone replied the other but as he spoke a door banged noisily and mr carlyle slipped into another seat and ensconced himself behind the copy of the globe creake himself he whispered across the car as a man appeared at the gate hollyer was right he has hardly changed waiting for a car i suppose but a car very soon swung past them from the direction in which mr creake was looking and it did not interest him for a minute or two longer he continued to look expectantly along the road then he walked slowly up the drive back to the house we will give him five or ten minutes decided carrados harris is behaving very naturally before even the shorter period had run out they were repaid a telegraph boy cycled leisurely along the road and leaving his machine at the gate went up to the cottage evidently there was no reply for in less than a minute he was trundling past them back again round the bend an approaching tram clanged its bell noisily and quickened by the warning sound mr creake again appeared this time with a small portmanteau in his hand with a backward glance he hurried on towards the next stopping place and boarding the car as it slackened down he was carried out of their knowledge very convenient of mr creake remarked carrados with quiet satisfaction 
we will now get the order and go over the house in his absence it might be useful to have a look at the wire as well it might max acquiesced mr carlyle a little dryly but if it is as it probably is in creek's pocket how do you propose to get it by going to the post office lewis quite so have you ever tried to see a copy of a telegram addressed to someone else i don't think i have ever had occasion yet admitted carrados have you in one or two cases i have perhaps been an accessory to the act it is generally a matter either of extreme delicacy or considerable expenditure then for hollyer's sake we will hope for the former here and mr carlyle smiled darkly and hinted that he was content to wait for a friendly revenge a little later having left the car at the beginning of the straggling high street the two men called at the village post office they had already visited the house agent and obtained an order to view brookbend cottage declining with some difficulty the clerk's persistent offer to accompany them the reason was soon forthcoming as a matter of fact explained the young man the present tenant is under our notice to leave unsatisfactory eh said carrados encouragingly he's a corker admitted the clerk responding to the friendly tone fifteen months and not a doit of rent have we had that's why i should have liked we will make every allowance replied carrados the post office occupied one side of a stationer's shop it was not without some inward trepidation that mr carlyle found himself committed to the adventure carrados on the other hand was the personification of bland unconcern you have just sent a telegram to brookbend cottage he said to the young lady behind the brasswork lattice we think it may have come in accurately and should like a repeat he took out his purse what is the fee the request was evidently not a common one oh said the girl uncertainly wait a minute please she turned a pile of telegram duplicates behind the desk and ran a doubtful finger along the upper sheets i think this is all right you want it repeated please just a tinge of questioning surprise gave the point to the courteous tone it will be fourpence if there is an error the amount will be refunded carrados put down a coin and received his change will it take long he inquired carelessly as he pulled on his glove you will most likely get it within a quarter of an hour she replied now oh, you've done it commented mr carlyle as they walked back to the car how do you propose to get that telegram max ask for it was the laconic explanation and stripping the artifice of any elaboration he simply asked for it and got it the car posted at a convenient bend in the road gave him a warning note as the telegraph boy approached then carrados took up a convincing attitude with his hand on the gate while mr carlyle lent himself to the semblance of a departing friend that was the inevitable impression when the boy rode up creek brookbend cottage inquired carrados holding out his hand and without a second thought the boy gave him the envelope and rode away on the assurance that there would be no reply some day my friend remarked mr carlyle looking nervously towards the unseen house your ingenuity will get you into a tight corner then my ingenuity must get me out again was the retort let us have our view now the telegram can wait an untidy workwoman took their order and left them standing at the door presently a lady whom they both knew to be mrs creake appeared you wish to see over the house she said in a voice that was utterly devoid of any interest then without waiting for a reply she turned to the nearest door and threw it open this is the drawing-room she said standing aside they walked into a sparsely furnished damp-smelling room and made a pretense of looking around while mrs creake remained silent and aloof the dining-room she continued crossing the narrow hall and opening another door mr carlyle ventured a genial commonplace in the hope of inducing conversation the result was not encouraging doubtless they would have gone through the house under the same frigid guidance had not carrados been at fault in a way that mr carlyle had never known him fail before in crossing the hall he stumbled over a mat and almost fell pardon my clumsiness he said to the lady i am unfortunately quite blind but he added with a smile to turn off the mishap even a blind man must have a house the man who had eyes was surprised to see a flood of colour rush into mrs creake's face blind she exclaimed oh i beg your pardon why did you not tell me you might have fallen i generally manage fairly well he replied 
but of course in a strange house she put her hand on his arm very lightly you must let me guide you just a little she said the house without being large was full of passages and inconvenient turnings carrados asked an occasional question and found mrs creek quite amiable without effusion mr carlyle followed them from room to room in the hope though scarcely the expectation of learning something that might be useful this is the last one it is the largest bedroom said their guide only two of the upper rooms were fully furnished and mr carlyle at once saw as carrados knew without seeing that this was the one which the creeks occupied a very pleasant outlook declared mr carlyle oh i suppose so admitted the lady vaguely the room in fact looked over the leafy garden and the road beyond it had a french window opening on to a small balcony and to this under the strange influence that always attracted him to light carrados walked i expect there is a certain amount of repair needed he said after standing there a moment i am afraid there would be she confessed i ask because there is a sheet of metal on the floor here he continued now that in an old house spells dry rot to the wary observer my husband said the rain which comes in a little under the window was rotting the boards there she replied he put that down recently i had not noticed anything myself it was the first time she had mentioned her husband mr carlyle pricked up his ears ah that is a less serious matter said carrados may i step out on the balcony oh yes if you like to then as he appeared to be fumbling at the catch let me open it for you but the window was already open and carrados facing the various points of the compass took in the bearings a sunny sheltered corner he remarked an ideal spot for a deck chair and a book she shrugged her shoulders half contemptuously i dare say she replied but i never use it sometimes surely he persisted mildly it would be my favourite retreat but then i was going to say that i had never been out on it but that would not be quite true it has two uses for me both equally romantic i occasionally shake a duster from it and when my husband returns late without his latch-key he wakes me up and i come out here and drop him mine further revelation of mr creake's nocturnal habits was cut off greatly to mr carlyle's annoyance by a cough of unmistakable significance from the foot of the stairs they had heard a trade cart drive up to the gate a knock at the door and the heavy-footed woman tramp along the hall excuse me a minute please said mrs creake lewis said carrados in a sharp whisper the moment they were alone stand against the door with extreme plausibility mr carlyle began to admire a picture so situated that while he was there it was impossible to open the door more than a few inches from that position he observed his confederate go through the curious procedure of kneeling down on the bedroom floor and for a full minute pressing his ear to the sheet of metal that had already engaged his attention then he rose to his feet nodded dusted his trousers and mr carlyle moved to a less equivocal position what a beautiful rose-tree grows up your balcony remarked carrados stepping into the room as mrs creake returned i suppose you are very fond of gardening i detest it she replied but this glory so carefully trained is it she replied i think my husband was nailing it up recently by some strange fatality carrados's most aimless remarks seemed to involve the absent mr creake do you care to see the garden the garden proved to be extensive and neglected behind the house was chiefly orchard in front some semblance of order had been kept up here it was lawn and shrubbery and the drive they had walked along two things interested carrados the soil at the foot of the balcony which he declared on examination to be particularly suitable for roses and the fine chestnut tree in the corner by the road as they walked back to the car mr carlyle lamented that they had learned so little of creake's movements perhaps the telegram will tell us something suggested carrados read it lewis mr carlyle cut open the envelope glanced at the enclosure and in spite of his disappointment could not restrain a chuckle my poor max he explained you have put yourself to an amount of ingenious trouble for nothing creake is evidently taking a few days holiday and prudently availed himself of the meteorological office forecast before going listen immediate prospect for london warm and settled 
further outlook cooler but fine well well i did get a pound of tomatoes for my fourpence you certainly scored there lewis admitted carrados with humorous appreciation i wonder he added speculatively whether it is creake's particular taste usually to spend his weekend holiday in london eh exclaimed mr carlyle looking at the words again by gad that's rum max they go to weston super mare why on earth should he want to know about london i can make a guess but before we are satisfied i must come here again take another look at that kite lewis are there a few yards of string hanging loose from it yes there are rather thick string unusually thick for the purpose yes but how do you know as they drove home again carrados explained and mr carlyle sat aghast saying incredulously good god max is it possible an hour later he was satisfied that it was possible in reply to his inquiry someone in his office telephoned him the information that they had left paddington by the four thirty for weston it was more than a week after his introduction to carrados that lieutenant hollyer had a summons to present himself at the turrets again he found mr carlyle already there and the two friends awaiting his arrival i stayed in all day after hearing from you this morning mr carrados he said shaking hands when i got your second message i was all ready to walk straight out of the house that's how i did it in the time i hope everything is all right excellent replied carrados you'd better have something before we start we probably have a long and perhaps an exciting night before us and certainly a wet one assented the lieutenant it was thundering over mulling way as i came along that is why you are here said his host we are waiting for a certain message before we start and in the meantime you may as well understand what we expect to happen as you saw there is a thunderstorm coming on the meteorological office morning forecast predicted it for the whole of london if the conditions remain that was why i kept you in readiness within an hour it is now inevitable that we shall experience a deluge here and there damage will be done to trees and buildings here and there a person will probably be struck and killed yes it is mr creake's intention that his wife should be among the victims i don't exactly follow said hollyer looking from one man to the other i quite admit that creake would be immensely relieved if such a thing did happen but the chance is surely an absurdly remote one yet unless we intervene it is precisely what a coroner's jury will decide has happened do you know whether your brother-in-law has any practical knowledge of electricity mr hollyer i cannot say he was so reserved and we really knew so little of him yet in eighteen ninety six an austin creek contributed an article on alternating currents to the american scientific world that would argue a fairly intimate acquaintanceship but do you mean that he is going to direct a flash of lightning only to the minds of the doctor who conducts the post-mortem and the coroner this storm the opportunity for which he has been waiting for weeks is merely the cloak to his act the weapon which he has planned to use scarcely less powerful than lightning but much more tractable is the high voltage current of electricity that flows along the tram wire at his gate oh exclaimed lieutenant hollyer as the sudden revelation struck him some time between eleven o'clock to-night about the hour when your sister goes to bed and one thirty in the morning the time up to which he can rely on the current creake will throw a stone up at the balcony window most of his preparation has long been made it only remains for him to connect up a short length to the window handle and a longer one at the other end to tap the live wire that done he will wake his wife in the way i have said the moment she moves the catch of the window and he has carefully filed its parts to ensure perfect contact she will be electrocuted as effectually as if she sat in the executioner's chair in sing sing prison but what are we doing here exclaimed hollyer starting to his feet pale and horrified it is past ten now and anything may happen quite natural mr hollyer said carrados reassuringly but you need have no anxiety creake is being watched and your sister is as safe as if she slept to-night in windsor castle be assured that whatever happens he will not be allowed to complete his scheme but it is desirable to let him implicate himself to the fullest limit your brother-in-law mr hollyer is a man with a peculiar capacity for taking pains he is a damned cold-blooded scoundrel exclaimed the young officer fiercely when i think of millicent five years ago 
well for that matter an enlightened nation has decided that electrocution is the most humane way of removing its superfluous citizens suggested carrados mildly he is certainly an ingenious-minded gentleman it is his misfortune that in mr carlyle he was fated to be opposed by an even subtler brain no no really max protested the embarrassed gentleman mr hollyer will be able to judge for himself when i tell him that it was mr carlyle who first drew attention to the significance of the abandoned kite insisted carrados firmly then of course its object became plain to me as indeed to anyone for ten minutes perhaps a wire must be carried from the overhead line to the chestnut tree creek has everything in his favour but it is just within possibility that the driver of an inopportune tram might notice the appendage what of that why for more than a week he has seen a derelict kite with its yards of trailing string hanging in the tree a very calculating mind mr hollyer it would be interesting to know what line of action mr creek has mapped out for himself afterwards i expect he has half a dozen artistic little touches up his sleeve possibly he would merely singe his wife's hair burn her feet with a red-hot poker shiver the glass of the french window and be content with that to let well enough alone you see lightning is so varied in its effects that whatever he did or did not do would be right he is in the impregnable position of the body showing all the symptoms of death by lightning shock and nothing else but lightning to account for it a dilated eye heart contracted in systole bloodless lungs shrunk to a third of their normal weight and all the rest of it when he has removed a few outward traces of his work creek might quite safely discover his dead wife and rush off for the nearest doctor or he may have decided to arrange a convincing alibi and creep away leaving the discovery to another we shall never know he will make no confession i wish it was well over admitted hollyer i'm not particularly jumpy but this gives me a touch of the creeps three more hours at the worst lieutenant said carrados cheerfully aha something is coming through now he went to the telephone and received a message from another quarter then made another connection and talked for a few minutes with someone else everything working smoothly he remarked between times over his shoulder your sister has gone to bed mr hollyer then he turned to the house telephone and distributed his orders so we he concluded must get up by the time they were ready a large closed motor-car was waiting the lieutenant thought he recognized parkinson in the well-swathed form beside the driver but there was no temptation to linger for a second on the steps already the stinging rain had lashed the drive into the semblance of a frothy estuary all round the lightning jagged its course through the incessant tremulous glow of more distant lightning while the thunder only ceased its muttering to turn at close quarters and crackle viciously one of the few things i regret missing remarked carrados tranquilly but i hear a good deal of colour in it the car slushed its way down to the gate lurched a little heavily across the dip into the road and steadying as it came upon the straight began to hum contentedly along the deserted highway we are not going direct suddenly inquired hollyer after they had travelled perhaps half a dozen miles the night was bewildering enough but he had the sailor's gift for location no through hunscott green and then by a field path to the orchard at the back replied carrados keep a sharp lookout for the man with the lantern about here harris he called through the tube something flashed just ahead sir came the reply and the car slowed down and stopped carrados dropped the near window as a man glistening in waterproof stepped from the shelter of a leech gate and approached inspector beadle sir said the stranger looking into the car quite right inspector get in i have a man with me sir we can find room for him as well we are very wet so shall we all be soon the lieutenant changed his seat and the two burly forms took places side by side in less than a minute the car stopped again this time in a grassy country lane now we have to face it announced carrados the inspector will show us the way the car slid round and disappeared into the night while beadle led the party to a stile in the hedge a couple of fields brought them to the brookbend boundary there a figure stood out of the black foliage exchanged a few words with their guide and piloted them along the shadows of the orchard to the back door of the house you will find a broken pane near the catch of the scullery window said the blind man right sir replied the inspector 
i have it now who goes through mr hollyer will open the door for us i'm afraid you must take off your boots and all wet things lieutenant we cannot risk a single spot inside they waited until the back door opened then each one divested himself in a similar manner and passed into the kitchen where the remains of a fire still burned the man from the orchard gathered together the discarded garments and disappeared again carrados turned to the lieutenant a rather delicate job for you now mr hollyer i want you to go up to your sister wake her and get her into another room with as little fuss as possible tell her as much as you think fit and let her understand that her very life depends on absolute stillness when she is alone don't be unduly hurried but not a glimmer of light please ten minutes passed by the measure of the battered old alarm on the dresser shelf before the young man returned i've had rather a time of it he reported with a nervous laugh but i think it will be all right now she is in the spare room then we will take our places you and parkinson come with me to the bedroom inspector you have your own arrangements mr carlyle will be with you they dispersed silently about the house hollyer glanced apprehensively at the door of the spare room as they passed it but within was as quiet as the grave their room lay at the other end of the passage you may as well take your place in the bed now hollyer directed carrados when they were inside and the door closed keep well down among the clothes creek has to get up on the balcony you know and he will probably peep through the window but he dare come no farther then when he begins to throw up stones slip on this dressing-gown of your sister's i'll tell you what to do after the next sixty minutes drew out to the longest hour that the lieutenant had ever known occasionally he heard a whisper pass between the two men who stood behind the window curtains but he could see nothing then carrados threw a guarded remark in his direction he is in the garden now something scraped slightly against the outer wall but the night was full of wilder sounds and in the house the furniture and the boards creaked and sprung between the yawling of the wind among the chimneys the rattle of the thunder and the pelting of the rain it was a time to quicken the steadiest pulse and when the crucial moment came when a pebble suddenly rang against the pane with a sound that the tense waiting magnified into a shivering crash hollyer leapt from the bed on the instant easy easy warned carrados feelingly we will wait for another knock he passed something across here is a rubber glove i have cut the wire but you had better put it on stand just for a moment at the window move the catch so that it can blow open a little and drop immediately now another stone had rattled against the glass for hollyer to go through his part was the work of merely seconds and with a few touches carrados spread the dressing-gown to more effective disguise about the extended form but an unforeseen and in the circumstances rather horrible interval followed for creake in accordance with some detail of his never revealed plan continued to shower missile after missile against the panes until even the unimpressionable parkinson shivered the last act whispered carrados a moment after the throwing had ceased he has gone round to the back keep as you are we take cover now he pressed behind the arras of an extemporized wardrobe and the spirit of emptiness and desolation seemed once more to reign over the lonely house from half a dozen places of concealment ears were straining to catch the first guiding sound he moved very stealthily burdened perhaps by some strange scruple in the presence of the tragedy he had not feared to contrive paused for a moment at the bedroom door then opened it very quietly and in the fickle light read the consummation of his hopes at last they heard the sharp whisper drawn from his relief at last he took another step and two shadows seemed to fall upon him from behind one on either side with primitive instinct a cry of terror and surprise escaped him as he made a desperate movement to wrench himself free and for a short second he almost succeeded in dragging one hand into a pocket then his wrists slowly came together and the handcuffs closed i am inspector beadle said the man on his right side you are charged with the attempted murder of your wife millicent creek you are mad retorted the miserable creature falling into a desperate calmness she has been struck by lightning no you blackguard she hasn't wrathfully exclaimed his brother-in-law jumping up would you like to see her i also warn you continued the inspector impassively that anything you say may be used as evidence against you a startled cry from the farther end of the passage arrested their attention 
mr carrados called hollyer oh come at once at the open door of the other bedroom stood the lieutenant his eyes still turned towards something in the room beyond a little empty bottle in his hand dead he exclaimed tragically with a sob with this beside her dead just when she would have been free of the brute the blind man passed into the room sniffed the air and laid a gentle hand on the pulseless heart yes he replied that hollyer does not always appeal to the woman strange to say End of